So, uh, I'm not a pilot. Uh, I'd like to think I connect more with you guys that I was a, a computer science major kind of in, in college, but then I went to the dark side and picked up an aerospace MBA. So, um, I, I can honestly say I've been doing more of the, the business side of all this stuff since, uh, since I finished that up back in 2005. Um, plan today is just kind of talk about everything. I think I can summarize up a lot of what James was talking about. I'll answer any more of those kind of law questions. Uh, but I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a pilot, I don't work for the FAA, uh, I'm not technically an engineer, uh, and I'm not a real academic, but I work at NC State, so, um, but I am, I don't even consider myself a, a drone advocate anymore, I'm more of a drone sympathizer, because uh, over the last two months, uh, everybody that got them under their Christmas tree took them out, threw on their YouTube video, and just watched them fly away. I watched them fly into the, uh, in, into the, uh, into the garage, so, um, there, there's, Lots of opportunities going on with this. Uh, I have been in this industry since 2000, um, working for a little software company down in Atlanta doing artificial intelligence for, uh, uh, for really accelerating autonomy. That's, that's my interest. Uh, hopefully we can talk about that tonight. Um, and you guys are the ones that help enable that. This is really where things are going. That's North Carolina's position in all this, uh, and I will definitely tie all that together. Uh, but uh, I'll admit too, I'm, I'm, I'm reusing slides. Uh, I got a lot going on right now, and last week I got invited to talk to the North Carolina Port Council. Um, and, and you want to talk about people who want to shoot them down, that's the whole theme of the day. But I started off with, uh, with this slide, uh, and people have been doing using drones now, so this was back before the FAA had all the Part 107 laws out. They were using their hobby aircraft to go fly at night targeting wild boar. Uh, that of course causing all kinds of problems. This would now definitely be considered illegal uh, because it is certainly no longer a hobby to go fly uh, and shoot wild pigs. Uh, but it's, it's being done, uh, the capabilities out there, there are people now getting the waivers to go to do this legally. Uh, so at that point uh, of the pig community, I would say drones are not friends. Um, as, we, as we move beyond that, certainly. Was he just using the drone to find? They were using them to find them. So it was flying at night uh, as a hobbyist. That's the piece they're busting. They did not have those armed. Uh, you might have seen the announcement last week too that our, our, our bacon population, our, our bacon supplies were down. Uh, some guys in Denmark were contributing to that. They were flying uh, spinning propellers now into pig sides to see what lacerations look like. So when they crash into us, we understand uh, what the impacts are going to be. Uh, so now we know where the bacon is going, that Denmark is just chewing it up in drone propellers. Uh, so drones are to blame for the, pit, for the bacon shortage. But drones are friends because they do enable pigs to fly. So uh, lots of things do happen. And, uh, and so we warmed things up with, uh, with that last week. Uh, our program, we've been here since 2012. Uh, the North Carolina Department of Transportation Division of Aviation said, this is clearly where aviation is going. This is modern aviation at its finest. Uh, how do we get ready for this? Kyle, can you come home to North Carolina uh, and get us prepared? So uh, for the last almost five years now, uh, I've been building up this ecosystem that says, how do we support the, uh, the research side? How do we support the economic development and the companies now that want to build these, that want to offer the services? How do we support the safe integration so other users of the airspace know what's going on? How do we work with the legislature and the General Assembly to say, we've got responsible uh, policies and laws uh, so that we're not seen as a state that's inhibiting drone operations. And a lot of states were looking at this, especially back in 2012 and 13, as we don't want to do this, we just want to ban them outright and say no flying. And those were the states that were saying, we're, we're not ready. Uh, North Carolina was not one of those, we have embraced this. Uh, and since then, we've got companies like Precision Hawk, that's what's flying down there in the bottom right corner, uh, building and growing. Uh, anytime you see a, a, an article about a drone company, Precision Hawk usually shows up, and it's Raleigh-based Precision Hawk, and we're super excited to have them uh, as part of our community. Um, we'll go through a quick run through. Uh, I think you've already we've beaten this horse, uh, but you know the guy on the left here, he's got a smile on his face, he's a hobbyist. Uh, the guy on the right, of course, is Precision Hawk. They're flying over farm fields. They're doing commercial stuff. As soon as the guy on the left flies that same aircraft to the same operation on the right, he's now a commercial operator. It's not about the aircraft. It's not about who he is. It's about the mission, according to the FAA. So if you're going to register, uh, you're going to register that guy as a commercial guy, and then he can fly for giggles on the weekends as a hobbyist. The farmer using it for his farm, it's his business. He still has to fly it as a commercial operator. 
the big ones, of course, um, they, they, they register a little differently, uh, but they're coming. Uh, they're not coming anytime soon to a commercial market near you, um, but they are coming to an airspace near us. Uh, this is a predator. The, uh, the gray eagle is about the same size. Uh, they are being based down at Fort Bragg uh, this year, uh, this spring actually. So uh, these are going to be flying more into restricted airspace uh, around Fort Bragg. I'm hoping to open up North Carolina as more of a command and control test bed so we can open these things up into more airspace around the state. One, to provide more training opportunities for the DOD, but also to really kind of accelerate our move into how do we have this integrated airspace for these things. Uber and Airbus, hang on that one. Uber and Airbus uh, are, are getting into this too. You've seen these stories here recently uh, that we're having pers autonomous personal aircraft. Uh, can we really get to that? Is the technology here now? You guys know this better than anybody. Yes, the technology's caught up. We've seen demos, we've seen things flying in here. That same technology now is going to move into this, just like it is in the Tesla cars and the driverless cars. North Carolina is well positioned for all this. If you look at our 72 public airports, how do we connect those uh, with this kind of capability or move beyond that into can we just now fly into downtown Raleigh, downtown Durham, and start parking on top of buildings? Uh, do buildings now, do, do the top floors of parking decks now become prime real estate? We'll see. So that's a, a quick overview on UAS. The FAA picked six test sites. I can tell you we're flying just as much as the six test sites are. Uh, so that was a, a, a win for us by not winning one of that, by not getting the designation, because we didn't get a whole bunch of overhead from the FAA to help manage that program. So uh, there was no funding behind that, so we've continued to grow. We are, however, part of the FAA Center of Excellence team. Uh, so the FAA has picked this team of 21 schools led by Mississippi State uh, to tackle all the tough problems to get ready for Amazon to start doing package delivery. Uh, but I'm going to agree with James on that one, that it ain't happening anytime soon. Uh, personally, I believe the model will invert in that we will all own our own drones and send them down the street to Walmart and Target to pick up the toothpaste we forgot to pick up. Uh, because that way we're responsible for the aircraft, we're responsible when the thing comes back and lands and doesn't hit the dog out in the backyard. The Center of Excellence team is going to help tackle all those challenges, both the technology development, the certifications, uh, and all the pieces, parts of that. We can talk more about that, but our piece on that is the command and control technology lead. So any of those research projects about cybersecurity, data links, autonomy, NC State is the lead for that for the FAA through our team. If you need the FAA website, it's there. That's where you can get all your registration information. Know before you fly is kind of a great place to send people to. If I'm really just getting into this, what do I need to know? It's a, it's, it's a good starter location. Um, and then the Before You Fly app is also a, a, uh, uh, the app that the FAA's got published out there. It'll tell you if you're within three miles, five miles of a, uh, of a heliport or an airport. It's a free app. It's out there. You can seriously pull it in your phone. You don't have to have a drone to go connect to it. You walk outside and just say, am I, where, where am I flying at? Am I, am I in a good spot or not? You get the red, green, yes, no kind of thing. Uh, part 107, we, James has covered that, uh, so I don't really, I'm not going to go into too much detail on Part 107, uh, so we'll, we'll stay away from there with the FAA. Uh, the, 72 fre the 72 little freckles there across North Carolina are 72 airports, so you think about those five miles of where am I at. Those are the five mile rings that you need to worry about with the FAA. The big circles there are the commercial airports. The squares are the, uh, are the restricted airspaces. I'm a little exaggerating there on the eastern side of the state, but not much. Uh, you really got to be careful when you're flying in North Carolina because we've got a very strong, uh, very robust aviation transportation system. So uh, it's one of, the, one of those things to be aware of. Uh, like I said, we've been flying since 2013 uh, under every possible structure the FAA has offered. The original Certificate of Authorization program, the COA, uh, which was a pain in the ass to get. Uh, we, we had at one point 25 COAs. Uh, we still have a nationwide COA for doing research. Uh, we've got locations we can fly up to 1,500 feet with aircraft over 200 pounds. Uh, so we've got uh, a broader window to do because we're NC State, we're research, we can do that. It's public information. We share all that information. So if you want pictures of corn, I got corn. <laughs> we've got over 1,000 flights and uh, about 200 hours of flight time, so that kind of gives you that calculation. If your battery lasts 10 minutes like Adrian does, uh, maybe 20 minutes, it takes a long time to get up to 200 hours of flight time. Uh, lots and lots of research, like I said, we, we've done the agriculture thing, uh, so I've got pictures of corn and wheat and cotton. Uh, we're also doing the, uh, the, the surveying thing, so I've got some construction sites, I'll show you that here in a minute. 
but the C2 thing is really where we want to focus on and what we're doing for the FAA right now. Uh, we've got lots of aircraft. Fixed wings fall under the same category. If it's less than 55 pounds, it's a small UAS. Whether it's got wings, it's got rotors, it's got uh, tilt rotors, uh, all of that counts as a, uh, as a small UAS by the FAA definitions. Uh, so we've kind of got all of that. We've helped build up the services. We also have a consortium now at NC State. We've got a whole bunch of industry partners and government agencies, including law firms. I've got to keep leaning on James to get him to join the, the fray here. Uh, that, uh, that, that want to be part of this, want to be part of a community now that's helping drive all this forward. So in addition to all the research funding we get from FAA, which isn't a whole lot, and North Carolina DOT to support their program, which isn't a whole lot, these folks have all come together and we say, where do we want to go as a community, regardless of what everybody else wants to do to help accelerate North Carolina into aviation. Uh, so I'm real proud to work with this, uh, this collection of folks and, uh, and we're going to keep moving forward. We've got a meeting coming up here in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then they uh, actually we've got a couple of big things planned for this year. So that's going well. I'll just flip through real quickly some of our uh, some examples of our work. Uh, like I said, a construction site flying over with the Trimble UX5. So that's a fixed wing aircraft that'll fly for about 45, 50 minutes. Um, we flew it for a 35 minute flight at uh, just under 400 feet. Uh, flew over this site, which is about 150 acres uh, there on the left. So 150 acre site, flew the whole thing in 35 minutes and it took uh, 800 pictures. Uh, that's about uh, 20 gigs worth of data uh, just for the raw imagery, then go stitch that together and put together a big uh, ortho mosaic like we did on the left side. Uh, it's not georeferenced, so it's not, uh, it's not that great, but you can take it down to about two centimeter resolution, uh, which is really good imagery uh, for doing surveying, but again, we are not a bunch of surveyors, we're a bunch of researchers. Uh, so that picture on the left is about a 20 gig file. You've got another 20 gigs worth of raw data that, uh, that built that picture. And then the digital elevation model on the right side uh, isn't quite that big. But you can see it's a big flat site. That's why it's all pretty much the same color. Yes, sir? What software they using? That is using, since we were flying the Trimble aircraft that day, we were using Trimble Business Center. Uh, Trimble gave us the airplane and gave us the software as part of their contribution into the membership. So they built that in-house. So they built that in-house, yep. Uh, we have used Agisoft. Uh, we've done a little bit with PIX4D, but really Agisoft and Triple Business Center are our two preferred suites. Um, we've got the Inspire. We've flown over Lake Raleigh there at NC State. Uh, for people that haven't seen imagery before, uh, I don't know if James's videos. Nope, you don't have the codec in there, so no quick time, we're good. But if you haven't seen Inspire video, it's, uh, it's super awesome. Uh, this is a shot also from the Inspire of flying over the Diverging Diamond Interchange. Has anybody driven through a DDI yet? Uh, so there's a couple around the state. There's about five or six of them. If you got a four or five year old in the back seat that's never driven through one of these that uh, actually pays attention, he'll go ape shit. Because um, you're driving in there and you cross over there, you kind of see it, right? At, uh, you, you, you cross over and then kind of go over this way. That way the traffic flows all back up over here instead of across the bridge. But when you start doing that crossover, you're like, whoa, where are you going? Um, but DOTs use this to, uh, to help introduce people to that. Um, but really, when you're flying this, the imagery looks just like this. It, there is no motion to it. We parked the aircraft at 150, about 200 feet up uh, with a 4K camera, uh, hands off for 15 minutes, let it run the battery, and you've got 15 minute videos of this. And I've got probably uh, 10 or 20 hours worth of these kinds of videos of just sitting there watching stuff, uh, looking at uh, traffic flows, looking at uh, lane intersections and how some of these things work. And, and DOT is real excited about getting this kind of quick response. You can see we're flying over here, uh, over the trees, over the uh, kind of the medians. Uh, we're not flying over anybody. If we could see uh, license plates or any of that, we would have had to blur all that out um, as just part of our data management processes. Uh, we've done emergency management work, working with both uh, Wake County, who is one of our industry partners uh, in the consortium, but also the state emergency management. Uh, they went out and got their COAs, so they've got nationwide permission to fly too. Uh, one of the things we were working with Wake County is they're integrating their, uh, their aircraft in. They've got an Inspire. They were wondering, what, what does it really take to get the processes down? Well, it takes three guys to fly the one unmanned aircraft, right? It takes the pilot to fly the airplane, the, the observer to keep eyes on, because this guy is going to be flipping back and forth. Where's the airplane? Where are we at? Where's the airplane? How am I doing? Monitoring system. Uh, so he's watching that. The observer is just keeping eyes on the aircraft because you have to maintain eyes on the whole time. And then this guy is controlling the, uh, the sensor on the airplane. Uh, so you can actually keep, you know, where are we at? Where are we surveying? What do we see from the ground? 
and he's also the interface then into the incident commander. Uh, so that really helped Wake County as they were developing their plan to say, you know what, it, it, it's not as easy as just I've got one guy, that's his pilot, it's met all of his qualifications because he can go do that, but can he really manage the system, talk to the interface, manage the camera and do all of that? Uh, no, you, you need at least two guys, but preferably three. Uh, so that really kind of helped them out as part of their planning. Uh, on the Assure stuff, and this is really, um, I, I, I talked about already, command and control is the future. Uh, when we were doling out who is going to take the leadership on what projects uh, on this one, I, there, were, there was certification and training. Uh, it doesn't get me excited. Uh, there was detect and avoid technology, so really kind of looking at those sensors, looking at, um, at ADSB and some of these new technologies that are, that are broadcasting. Uh, I'm like, yeah, all right, that's, that's cool. Uh, some people looking at airworthiness, you know, what happens when we go crashing into people, uh, crashing into other aircraft, you know, so we've actually got videos of flying into leading edges, uh, all in research environments, so it was all uh, controlled. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but I said, C2, I, I want that one, because C2 really does encompass um, data links, cybersecurity, uh, and, and the fuzzy word that, uh, that's like saying Voldemort, it, it, you walk into FAA and you say autonomy and they give you the look of, you're not supposed to say autonomy when you walk into FAA headquarters. And I do it every time I go in there just to piss them off. Because uh, it's really where all this stuff is going. If we've got this ability now to actually take all this data, work with that information now and turn aviation and turn the airspace into a digital world, how do we take advantage of that now to make aircraft more efficient? So that when we do start doing Amazon package deliveries, we can say, here's our highway in the sky, and it's gonna be basically habit trails all over the place. And I can say, yes, my aircraft's flying this path, this corridor for the next five minutes, and nobody else can check out that habit trail. Uh, that's how this is going to work, and that state that adopts that first uh, is gonna be the state that's ready for the modern aviation world. Uh, just like we couldn't build the, uh, the DC metro system today, we just flat out can't afford it. We're in that same place right now with, with aviation. So that's what we're tackling with the Center of Excellence. We've got lots of ways to help organizations get stood up, whether it's uh, uh, commercial companies now doing surveying, is it uh, state agencies, we walk them through all these things, uh, their expectation management. So I get that phone call once a week, hey, I'm ready to start my drone program, which aircraft do I need to go buy? What, what are you doing? Are you just doing ag? Are you just doing surveying? What kinds of missions do you want? And we really kind of walk through all of that down to how are you going to manage that data? When is it captured? Who captures it? Who gets to see it? What are your permissions? How long are you sitting on it? And walk through that, that whole life cycle. Part 107, I don't think there's anything new on here that hasn't been beaten up. Uh, the one aircraft per operator is another one of the, uh, the things that uh, Intel had to get the waiver for for the, um, for the Super Bowl over the weekend. Because uh, they did actually fly that, basically one operator from, for one system. He hit the launch button and the whole thing took off and went and did its thing. So the FAA gave them a waiver for that one uh, in addition to the night ops and everything else they did when they did the, uh, uh, the pre-planned, uh, the early recording. Uh, uh, not flying uh, over anybody not involved with the operations, so that's where blurring out and, uh, and, and getting those permissions if you're flying and, and capturing those videos. Um, no transportation of hazardous materials, uh, so nobody's doing crop dusting or crop spraying today because uh, those chemicals do count as, as hazardous materials. That's also where the gun law comes in. Uh, but transportation of products for compensation, so you can do package delivery today uh, under Part 107 if you fall within line of sight. So if somebody can tell me a business model that I can go deliver a package that I can see the whole thing from launch to recovery, uh, and you can tell me that makes you money, I'd love to hear what that is because I haven't heard it yet. I've had farmers tell me, well, hey, I want to do that for a, a farm to table concept. <laughs> what are you going to do, man? You're going to walk out in the field and say, I want this, you know, th this head of lettuce, pluck it and send it back to the, to the kitchen be a drone? Real time satellite. Real time, there you go, I guess. So, um, it's all there, uh, but those are the rules, those are the basic rules. If you want the 600 page document, we've got that too. Um, the, uh, you must pass the, the, the pilot test and you gotta be at least 16. So when, uh, when, when Van's son gets his, uh, his next drone, uh, he's ready to start surveying you know, rooftops and tell neighbors, hey, for 10 bucks I can go clean out your gutters because hey, I've got a video that shows they're, they're clogged. Uh, he's gotta wait another five years before he can do it. Um, but we're getting there and it is that kind of capability. And like I say down here, the FA will waive just about every one of these. You can't waive the 55 pounds. Uh, that's why we fly under our COAs and we're ready to support industry partners that need that help. 
the DOT stuff uh, at the state level, uh, if you want those references for which state laws uh, Van already kind of covered, or uh, James already covered the, uh, the list, um, which ones are, are which, uh, it's all up there, including that, uh, that one here that you must have permission from the landowner for launch and recovery sites. Uh, that is both private and public. Uh, so that's how the, uh, the, the, the local municipalities can say, we don't want anybody flying in our parks, you're not taking off of our roads. Uh, and back to the pork farmers that are worried about flying over the pig farms. Uh, if you don't give them permission to launch and recover off of your farm, if your neighbor doesn't and the state doesn't give them permission to go use the county road, uh, then there shouldn't be anybody flying in those areas spying on your pigs. Uh, but those are all um, spelled out there. We can get into any more of that detail. We helped DOT write the aeronautical knowledge test for the North Carolina permit. It's 25 questions. Uh, you can hop online on the, on the DOT website. You can take the test from there. You pull up the study guide in one screen. You pull up the knowledge test in the other screen. Uh, and you guys are all kind of computer people. Uh, so you're going to have two screens. Uh, if it takes you more than 15 minutes to take the test as an open book test, there's something wrong with your internet, it's not the uh, test. <laughs> the, the intent there is not uh, to say that you, you're, you're, you're really a pilot. Uh, the intent there is to say that yes, you're aware of North Carolina has a bunch of laws. Uh, and so that's why it's an open book test. Basically, you, if you pass the test, you've, you've read the laws. Uh, but the DOT website walks through all that. Right now, it's free. Later this spring, they're going to add a five or ten dollar fee to take the permit. So, <clears throat> intent. Um, go get it now. It's good for two years. Um, there's three. There's three certificates you can print out of there. Uh, if you print this permit for the uh, for the commercial operator, you guys aren't going to be government operators. If you are a commercial operator and you do a government contract, you're still a commercial operator. Van, James will help you write the contract uh, to go do that, so you meet all the FAA laws. Um, if you print out, if you take the test and you print out the certificate that says, congratulations, you're a hobbyist, you can show your mom. She's the only one that'll care because this is the only one the government guys care about. Uh, if you need these resources, the FAA website's here, the, my website's here, uh, the FAA's here, DOT's here, I'm in the middle. Uh, if you want the big part 107 rules, uh, all 600 pages are there. Uh, if you're interested in the association for all this stuff, uh, AUVSI is it, the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. And last question here, uh, back to the shoot them down thing. It is illegal, you're shooting an aircraft. So you let Darwin take care of it, you put the Roman candle on the aircraft and you shoot each other. <laughs> These guys are pretty good shots. So Darwin will win here eventually that, uh, you know, it's not the drone's fault when somebody shoots each other with the, uh, with the Roman candle off the aircraft. So uh, again, that's not weaponized, that's, a, uh, um, that's just idiots. <laughs> um, but, but, but if you don't like that path, again, you can't shoot them down, um, but you can take your other tools up and just take care of things the old-fashioned way and just knock it out of the sky. Clearly, she wasn't having it anymore. This is a, a, a chimp out in, um, in, in Finland, actually, at a zoo there, and uh, she knew what she was doing. She, she, just, she was just over it. Uh, if, if you don't have the tools ready or you, you really got the disposable funds, uh, you can also just kind of knock them out of the sky. Um, so again, I didn't shoot it. Uh, nobody's going to complain. Uh, I just took care of business. Last, uh, last story I'll give you, and then we'll uh, open up for some more questions. Um, the FAA and, uh, and local uh, police department in, uh, in L.A. Uh, actually was doing a, uh, a, uh, a recovery last week. They had a, a driver that actually drove over one of those California cliffs there on the ocean. And uh, they were doing a rescue mission with a Black Hawk helicopter. And uh, everything was work going well. They had the rescue over. They had the helicopter over the scene. And then, of course, the idiot comes out with his drone to go see what's going on. And as soon as the local law enforcement saw the drone in the air, radioed it up to the, uh, to the Black Hawk crew, we got to go down. Uh, they could not be up. They weren't going to share the airspace because uh, that, that, that one was not coordinated. Uh, so they jumped down, and, uh, and then LAPD followed through uh, and arrested the guy for interfering now with manned aircraft. So um, between that one and uh, you may have seen the video, uh, I probably should have squeezed that in here, uh, but the pig guys didn't care. Uh, New Year's Eve, so December 31st this year uh, in um, Seattle, guys flying over around the Space Needle during the day, 
in the afternoon of the 31st getting ready for the night ops. Uh, during the day they were out and they had their little phantom or something and uh, they, they were flying around the Space Needle just kind of getting their bearings set and he lost control at the Space Needle and crashed it into the top of that when a couple workers were up on top getting ready. Uh, if you haven't seen the video, it's a great video because it's, you know, that's awesome, it's cool, you're flying around. Knowing it's December 31st, there's a ton of people down there um, below the Space Needle, it's always populated, so you're busting that rule. Sure, the Space Needle is 600 feet, but by the rule, actually, he wasn't busting the FAA rule for being too high because he was still within within that range of the uh, Space Needle. He could say he could actually fly up to 400 feet above the Space Needle, and the FAA would be fine with that uh, because it is a, uh, a structure. Um, but it was flying over people and clearly lost control over it, so it just crashed in there. Nobody was hurt, um, but uh, he had followed the process. It was a registered aircraft, so the FAA has followed up with him a phone call. If you need my stuff, it's all here. If you want the DOT guy because you don't think I know what I'm talking about or you'd rather hear an official person talk, uh, the DOT websites and, uh, and information is also there. I'm happy to share the slides uh, with Jeremy or anybody else if they need to be posted. So I'm open for questions. I'm sure James will take questions or Adrian will take questions too if we've got anything else. Yes, sir. I got two different questions. Sure. Okay, alternative energy, uh, gasoline engines, hydrogen fuel cells, solar panels, whatever it is you got, right? Uh, if it's less than 55 pounds, you're fine, total weight. So um, the, where, where the 55 pound number comes from, if you're in the community, there's some debate. Uh, if you're outside the community, you're a conspiracy guy, you can, I'll, I'll give you the real answer. Uh, so circa 2001, 2002, a small UAS was either a, uh, a pointer or a dragon eye, which is a little bitty fixed wing, about yay big, um, built by Air Environment, or a Boeing Scan Eagle, or in situ Scan Eagle, which is a 55 pound, 10 foot wingspan aircraft that weighs 55 pounds. Uh, and in 2002, if that's a small UAS, we're gonna make sure that whatever the definition of a small UAS includes that. Uh, and so that's a gas powered in aircraft that'll fly for 20 hours. Um, it'll, it prefers to fly 2,500 to 5,000 feet, you can fly at 400 feet, but it's not very efficient or safe, really. And my second question yep. has to do with, I was thinking in terms of long-term, an IAEA, a drone flying in place for long-term, acting as a relay, radio relay in emergency situations, thinking in ham radio, thinking yep. so, so can drones act as a radio relay? Um, like a like a repeater in emergency situations. In all kinds of situations, yes. Uh, but you have to still maintain that line of sight. Uh, so if your relay station guy can sit there and watch his, and then your rest of your people are kind of staggered out watching theirs. Communications is line of sight anyway. This allows two stations to be yep. on line of sight by both being line of sight. Yep. As long as they're all below 400 feet and there's the pilot that's flying each aircraft or whatever your Links are, yes. That's a great application. Yep. Okay. With all this regulation, has the drone ever interfered with an aircraft and caused an accident? Has it ever interfered with an aircraft and caused an accident? Are there any documented drone aircraft accidents? Actual accidents? None that I have heard of. But. Does that mean that they, they couldn't? Does that mean the pilot uh, is, 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 is a safe one? Yeah, I, but that, that's the challenge. And, and now that we have... How many we're gonna have? Oh, that's what I was about to say. So with over 700,000 registered by the FAA today, that outnumbers manned aircraft three to one. The density of the airspace can handle it. Are the procedures in place today? No. Is the technology in place yet to coordinate all that? No. Do manned air, I know we're getting more questions. Do manned aircraft know when these things are up? No, and under part 107, there is no requirement for a NOTAM to be posted today. So now you're going out there and you're throwing aircraft up and we've got people in this room that have experience doing that to say, yes, I, I've gone out and I've flown and nobody knew you were out there. If you're flying an airport. But if you're flying, say, a, an emergency response situation, post Hurricane Matthew, 
and you're flying down around Cumberland County and we've had the, 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 the dams, the bridges are all threatened right now with floodwaters. There's a temporary flight restriction popped up. So no, no manned aircraft should be flying, but now, okay, I just wanna run down and go fly. Who else knows you're up there? Should you be the only one up there? Do you really have access to, to, to go fly in that airspace? So there's a lot of questions and we're actually working in the state to help support those notifications and work on those communication structures with our, our state agencies. Oh yeah? yeah? I hadn't heard that one. Somebody, I don't know all the details of the story, but somebody definitely went to jail. Okay. No, I mean, why not? Aircraft that come back around the land. It's like a bird's breath. Yes, sir. Your unmanned aircraft, does it fly? An unmanned powered, an unmanned powered tethered system is still counts as a UAS. So, so a blimp is different, an aerostat is different, but a tethered aircraft, a uh, powered aircraft, uh, counts as a UAS. What is, what do they define as blimp? So the, the, the flat out blimp that's an aerostat that doesn't have any kind of rotor thrust, right. Okay, so no thrust at all. Right. Okay. And so you have the orbital seven, you have the right. Yeah, you all, in, in, in the state of North Carolina right now, you have your FAA license and your North Carolina permit. The insurance is optional. Highly recommended, uh, especially if you're doing a commercial operation. That's all, you're, you're cleared hot to go fly. You may never even have put your hands on an aircraft, right? Uh, you can win Adrian's Bebop over here um, and say you now wanna, you wanna go pass the part 107 test tonight when you get home, you can take the test online. Well, actually, you can take the test and get to the airport. Just, you can take the North Carolina one today before you get part 107. The next version may be done. Last question. Last question. I'll be around for a little bit afterwards. It's probably uh, halftime. Two minutes really quick. Uh, at the decision hawk level of aviation, are there TCAS systems that are being considered for uh, some of these aircraft? The same question quick is, if you're uh, out in Orange County drag strip and you create a sport that uses uh, uh, the aircraft, Okay, uh, start with the TCAS question, right? So are there collision avoidance systems for small UAS yet? Uh, Precision Hawk is working on their lattice technology, low aircraft, uh, low altitude transport, low altitude traffic alert system. There we go. Uh, so that's a small UAS using a cellular device instead of a TCAS system uh, for air traffic management now. So basically all these small aircraft now will tap into the cellular system using the private network side uh, and now everything is supposedly connected. Uh, that's under development right now. We're helping Precision Hawk with some of that testing this year. Uh, lots of the universities within the Assure system are helping with that technology. Uh, there, we're looking at that. We're looking at ADSB, which is a GPS based. We're wondering if the spectrum can support 500,000, a million ADSB hits uh, because it wasn't built for that, it was built for manned aircraft. Uh, does it even work at low altitudes below 400 feet? Really today, no. Uh, and so TCAS doesn't work for that. Can we equip these things? That's where really it's an IOT thing, right? If we can figure out that device that says, here's how everything can be connected, share that information. Uh, is it through cellular networks? Is it through some other spectrum? Is it through what? Uh, so if you've got ideas for that, we'd love to hear how that, uh, how that works, uh, what we can do to do some of that testing. So that's a great question. I appreciate that one. Uh, on the, uh, can we now go out to the, uh, to the racetrack here, develop a, uh, a, a drone racing, a drone gladiator, a drone whatever league uh, that goes and really kind of pushes these things out there. What waivers are needed? Um, the waiver side of that one's probably pretty easy. It depends on if you're actually gonna fly over people. If you're just out in the open space there, um, that one probably won't require anything other than if you're starting to push the 55 pounds. Um, so that one's not a big deal. Um, I'm gonna to touch the drone racing thing again. Um, but um, on that one, it's uh, it really, um, if you're gonna do it commercially, uh, if you are gonna make money off of it, charge for entry fees and those kinds of things, you can count on that being a commercial thing. The drone racing thing right now is sitting in gray space. 
um, because I mean, there, there are the leagues that are formed up. They're, they're riding on that hobbyist thing. If you're flying inside, the FAA doesn't give a damn. Now, you guys can fly in here all you want to. That, that's why Adrian didn't need any permissions or anything to do that. Uh, if you even zoom in right overhead, that comes back to the, uh, the owner of the facility gets to define those things because that's an insurance. Um, and so, so that's really where that one kind of sits. Personally, I feel that drone racing is a, uh, is a sport that should do er that's doing everything it can to make itself obsolete as fast as it can. The faster we get to autonomy, the f and if you've ever seen a, an RC pilot, a remote control pilot, compared to a fully autonomous UAV, the UAV is gonna sit there and adjust, and when you tell it to park at five feet in the air and hold it, even if you turn the fan on, it's gonna do everything it can to stay in that one spot. Whereas the pilot's gonna sit there and he's gonna say, I'm in the spot, where the aircraft is holding that. The autonomy of these things is gonna to continue to advance to where I can zoom around the building, I can do whatever it can, with the sensors, with the commands, without needing the, the, the human input. Uh, if it takes the fun out of it because you want to sit here and do all this and your FPV goggles and everything else, that's fine. But I mean, that's where the technology is going to get to, just like it should be going that way with NASCAR. But then you're getting into my personal feelings. So um, I'll stop here for now. I know uh, Jeremy wants to do some more talking, and uh, and I will uh, I'll stick around for a little bit and uh, talk to you.